That's what I was talking about. That was a great job by all you guys. What a, that was a great time of worship, don't you agree? It was. I want you to take your Bible. I'm going to show you several different verses, <clears throat> but not as many as I usually have. Uh, still, still several. I want to pray and I want to ask God to be with us this morning and I'm going to pick up on a topic that we talked about last week, the last service of 2017. And we're going to talk about today, the first service, Sunday morning service of 2018. We also talked about this on Wednesday night. And I'll be honest with you, I have no plans of, of leaving this topic right now. It's kind of where I'm at. Um, we're talking about the kingdom of God. There's so much said in scripture about the kingdom of God. In fact, if you go get a Strong's Concordance and look up the word kingdom, you're going to find that probably... 50, almost 60 times just in the book of Matthew, the little phrase is used, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's used all throughout the New Testament. The idea and the premise is used all throughout the Old Testament. And I began preaching this little subject that I was studying on my own and began unpacking some things to you guys. And I want to continue to do this. And honestly, there, this is a deep well of truth that we've gotten into uh, here this morning. So I want to pray and I want to ask God to bless us. And I want, you to, I, want, I want you to listen to me very closely this morning, if you will. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and I yield to you, Lord. I have nothing humanly to give to these people. But Lord, I do have a book that is never wrong. It always has been and it always will be. It's full of truth. And Father, it's what I need and it's what these people need here today. And I pray, God, that you will empower me and fill me with your spirit to preach, not in the way that I want to preach, but in the way that you want to preach. And, Father, as, I, as my words go forth, I pray that your Holy Spirit will go heart to heart, mind to mind, and do your work inside of us. To those of us who are saved, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I just pray, God, that you will speak to us and use us here this morning, challenge us in the ways that we need I yield to you, Lord, and I ask your blessings upon this message. If there's anybody here that's not saved, I pray that today they would be saved. If there's anybody here who is saved, but desperately in need of truth, I pray that right now they'll just separate everything else, move everything else out of our mind and our hearts, and help us to focus on your word and let it do its healing and its work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 11, verse number 2 is a very famous passage of Scripture. It's where we find the Lord's Prayer. How many have ever heard of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. We recite it, we say it. The disciples, the way this prayer came up, the disciples came to Jesus one day and they said, Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And it's very amazing because Jesus gave them this prayer. He prayed this prayer. It is my belief as a Bible student that Jesus did not intend solely for this to be a prayer that we pray the literal verbatim words, but it was a model prayer. There were some things about this prayer that we are to include and have in our prayer lives. And there's a little phrase in there, and if you were here last Sunday morning, you were here on Wednesday night, this little phrase captured my mind and my heart, and I began to study this, and uh, I want to uh, give you a, a very poignant message this morning. I wanna, I've entitled this message, The Conquest of the Kingdom. The Conquest of the Kingdom. I want every teenager to listen to me very closely this morning. I want every, every college student. Every mom and dad, this is for you, and I'm going to give you some application, but this is for our Christian lives, and I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about here in just a second. Jesus' his disciples say, teach us to pray. In verse number 2 of chapter 11, Luke, he says this, and he said unto them, when ye pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then he says this verse right here, this little phrase, 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. So when the first part of the, the Lord's Prayer as we know it is Jesus saying to you, hey, if you want to know how to pray, this is how you pray. Our Father, first of all, you got to have the right relationship. And there's so much truth here. And I don't have time to get into all of it. Have the right relationship, a father, son, father, daughter relationship, okay? Uh, you have to be his child to have a true prayer life if you want to know how to pray. And he says, say, our Father, which art in heaven. That's where God's at. We know from studying scripture that after Jesus died on the cross and went back to heaven, after three days, he rose bodily and he ascended back to heaven. And the Bible says he is set down at the right hand of God. If you want to know where God the Father is this morning, God the Father is on his throne, okay? He is sovereign and he is ruling the world, okay? God the Father is still in charge, amen? And that's where he's at. And if you want to know where Jesus is, He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Only one time in Scripture do we see Jesus doing anything else after he got back to heaven that's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And that was when Stephen was stoned. And the Bible says that Stephen got opened up a window into heaven and he could see into the throne room of God. And as they were killing Stephen, Stephen put a big smile on his face, looked up to heaven. And the Bible says he saw the Son of God not sitting at the right hand of the Father, but standing at the right hand of the Father. The ultimate Hey, that is the way you do it right there. Stephen, you're giving your life for me. And you know what? He stood to give Stephen a big amen, boy. That's the way you do it. Don't you give in. You stand strong. And they killed him. And just a few minutes later, he met Jesus face to face, I believe. Amen. But here's what he says. He says, if you want to pray, pray our Father which art in heaven. That's where God is. Hallowed be thy name. But then he says this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The first thing that Jesus tells us to pray for is pray for the kingdom of God to come. To come where? To come to where you're at. The first thing that Jesus says, if if, if you were to say, hey, if, if I come to you and I said, hey, give me the top five things on your prayer list, what would you tell me? You'd probably say, new job, nicer husband. Less grouchy wife, right? More money. We have the provisions top our prayer list. I'm the same way. If you say, hey, give me the top five, I guarantee you that outside of this morning, the top five wouldn't be thy kingdom, that God's kingdom would come down to where I'm at. But when they asked Jesus how to pray, he said, here's how you pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Or, just like it is in heaven, I want it to be that way here. What he is saying is, I want your kingdom, and I'm praying your kingdom, God, comes to where I'm at. I want your kingdom to come down to where I walk today. I want your kingdom to come down to my life. I want your kingdom to come down to my heart today. I want your kingdom to come down to my hands and my feet today. I want your kingdom to come down to my eyes and my ears today. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What's he not saying there? My kingdom come and my will be done. He's saying lay yourself. It's the same thing Paul said, Romans 12, 1 and 2. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus said, you are to pray that his kingdom would come down to where you're at. To your life, to your marriage, to your home, to your career, to your finances, to your job, to your business, to your kids, to your college graduates, to your brand new family, to your brand new little baby. That is what you are to pray that God's kingdom would come like it is in heaven down to where you're at. Now if you look and if you note takers want to write this down, the word kingdom there is very interesting. If you look it up in the Greek, it is Strong's. Greek number 932, and it is the Greek word basilia. And here's what basilia means. It means, now listen to this, the realm 
in which a king sovereignly rules. What is a kingdom? It is the area or the realm in which a king rules, right? It is the area or the realm in which a king solemnly or sovereignly, excuse me, rules. Okay? The area that he rules in. So what Jesus is saying, don't lose me. Every teenager, listen to me very close because this is going to tie into your life here. What Jesus is saying here is that our number one prayer should be that God's kingdom would come just like it is in heaven down to where I live and that I would stake out some new kingdom territory for God to solemnly rule and reign in. What he's saying is the kingdom of God rules in heaven and I am to invite heaven and God to rule in the areas that I walk in. And when I do that, I am establishing a greater and larger kingdom that God rules because he rules the area I'm walking in now. Does that make sense? You are an ambassador, the Bible says, for Christ. So what you're doing when you walk through life and you walk through your marriage and your home and raising your kids and your business and, and, and what you do with your ears and your eyes and your hands and your feet, you are saying when you invite the kingdom of God in, come in God and you rule where my feet walk. You rule where my hands touch. You rule what my eyes see. You rule what my tongue says. He is saying, you pray that God's kingdom, the realm in which he rules, would invade where you're at. Okay? The kingdom of God. That's what the kingdom of God is. Now let me, if you weren't here the last two messages, let me bring you up to speed. You are inviting the kingdom in or you're staking out territory for God to reign in. We see three places that this happens in scripture. Okay? Okay? Three places that we know that the kingdom of God was evident in. Number one, if you're taking notes, we see it in this verse. In heaven, God's kingdom reigns, right? Watch this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. So can I tell you this morning... That where God is in heaven, His very presence, the presence of God... The Father, where He is, His kingdom reigns, okay? He's in charge. That is the realm in which He reigns in, is the heavenly kingdom, right? So in heaven right now, where Jesus is, where God the Father is, sitting on the throne, and Jesus at His right hand, right there is the kingdom of God. The second place that we see the kingdom of God ruling in the Bible, and I told you this last message, is the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, God's kingdom ruled there before sin entered in. God's kingdom ruled in the Garden of Eden. God's kingdom ruled there. God was in charge. Adam and Eve were obedient to God. They had not broken the commands of God. And there were commands, as we looked last Sunday, there were commands to obey God before sin entered the picture. So commandments are not bad in, in and of themselves. Commandments were good. God gave them five commandments. He said, I want you to take care of the garden, subdue it. I want you to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He gave them five things to do and they were doing them. And the realm of the reign of God reigned in Eden. Okay. God was in charge. In fact, God's presence came down, we find, and walked with them in the garden of Eden. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden of Eden. Eden, that's the kingdom of God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is he saying? I'm inviting the kingdom of God to rule down here. The, where we see that is in heaven. We see it in the Garden of Eden because God's kingdom ruled even though it was on earth. It was God's kingdom, right? And Adam and Eve coexisted in God's kingdom with God. There's a third place that we see this kingdom of God ruling and reigning. And that is in the future. In the future, we know that the kingdom of God will reign. I want to show you a verse, Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 1. Now, by the way, this is after the tribulation period, seven years. This is after the Antichrist, after the false prophet, after the beast. 
This is after the millennium. Okay? The Bible says this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Let me show you a couple other verses. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Watch this. If you want to know what heaven is going to be like, this describes, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, describes what heaven will be like. And guess what it is? New heaven, new earth, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming, what? Down from God. Out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. If you look up those Greek words coming down, back up one verse, Paul. If, if you look at those Greek words there coming down from God, it is stepping down out of the sky will be the kingdom of heaven. And it will be stepping down to the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? The new Jerusalem that Jesus has been working on, that he promised us. If I go away, I'll prepare a place for you. That's what he's talking about. But that place is going to descend down to a new heaven and a new earth. And watch what verse number 3 says. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. Who will dwell with them? God will dwell with man, right? Just like he did in heaven right now. Just like he did in the Garden of Eden he will dwell with them, and what, what's this, what it says? And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. There will be literally heaven on earth, if you want to know what heaven's like. God says, I'm going to come down, I'm going to establish my kingdom. That's what we call the kingdom of God that will last forever, and Jesus will reign as the King of kings and the Lord of lords forever. Amen? So it has been already, and by the way, if you're, if you're following, because this, I always share my pet peeves because I'm not shy, right? When somebody says, well, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. It's not true. I've even had some people say, Brandon, you should only preach from Matthew to Revelation and not preach from Genesis to Malachi. Because the Old Testament's for the, that's, that's, I've, I've, I've had them call it, that's the Old Bible. You need to be preaching that New Bible. Let me tell you something. I just got one Bible, okay? And it fits all together, and it's the same God. And let me prove it to you. The way God made it in the beginning is the way that it's going to come full circle back to be. God's presence, when God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the garden and walked with them, and they communed with him. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to give you what they had with him. I'm going to bring, because, uh, you know, last week we had a lot of folks traveling Wednesday night. We're, we're kind of getting settled back in. we got a good group here today. I want to bring you up to speed because this is so vitally important that you understand the kingdom of God. Because salvation and being a Christian is so much more than just getting a get out of hell free card. Said, I'm going to heaven. And I am going to heaven, amen. But I, I was created for more than that. And God made Adam and Eve and he walked with them in the garden and they lived in the kingdom of God come down to earth. He walked with them. He reigned there. His will was done as it is in heaven there. And we see that it will be again after all the end time prophecies pr play out. God will establish his permanent rule. Now let me show you something and I gave you this last week and I just want to give you these four things very quickly. Again to those of you that weren't here. Forgive me, I'm suffering from a cold and my mouth is so dry, I, can't, I just got to keep pouring water in it, right? There's four things that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden that are four key characteristics of the kingdom of God. Number one, they had a relationship, okay? Are you with me? They had a relationship. Adam and Eve did not have an earthly mom and dad. They were put together and created by God. He took dust of the earth and formed the man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You remember that? Adam did not have a daddy outside of God. He was created in God. He was, had that relationship of the father and the son. And let me tell you this. If you don't have that relationship, you can never live in the kingdom. 
If you do not have a relationship with God, you are born of man. You have a physical mama and a physical daddy, and you, uh, you, you look to them. They are your parents. But let me tell you this. If you have never been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, that's why Jesus said you must be born again. Why? Because to live in the kingdom of God, you have to have what? Relationship. You have to have the right relationship. That's why Jesus said, if you want to know how to pray, pray this, our Father. Did you know that Jesus always prayed our Father, our Father, our Father, 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 if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Father, 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 Father. He prayed that. Only one time in Scripture did he pray anything other than Father. That's when he was on the cross being punished by God for your sin. He said, my God, my God. Why? Because he was standing in the place of you. And you were paying your debt. Now let me tell you something. you got to have the right relationship with God. If you've never been born again, you must have a time in your life where you came face to face with Jesus. Your mama can't do it for you. Your daddy can't do it for you. Your preacher can't do it for you. But you come face to face with Jesus, realize that you are lost without him. And you come to him and say, Jesus, I know that you died for me on the cross. You did it for me, not for what you owed, but for what I owed. And I need to be saved. You're the only one that can save me. And you put your faith and your trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ three days later. If you buy that and you ask him to save you, you are born again and you have the right relationship. Amen? And let me tell you something. Some of us think that's where it stops. I got the right relationship. I'm on my way to heaven. Now it doesn't matter how I live. Now it doesn't matter what I do. That's not true. Because Adam and Eve have had four things in the Garden of Eden. They had the right relationship. But let me tell you this. They had fellowship and communion with God. And I went through this at length last week and I can't take the time to do it again. They had fellowship and communion. And let me tell you this. If you have the right relationship, that relationship will never go away. But your fellowship can. Are you with me? When Adam and Eve sinned, their butts got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Why? Because they broke the fellowship with God. Were they still his children? Yes. If you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, you will never lose your relationship. But how you live your life affects your fellowship. Right? And the reason Adam and Eve had the kingdom of God in their life is because they had proper communion and fellowship with God. They first had the relationship and that allowed them to have the fellowship, right? But then something else, they had purpose. They had purpose. They found their purpose. God gave them commands. He said, keep the garden, subdue it, uh, replenish it, uh, multiply. And he gave them five things to do. And they were doing that because when you have the proper relationship and you open up lines of fellowship and communion with God through worship, through the word of God and walking with God, it leads you to stumble on and find what you were put on this earth for. So many people are wondering, why in the world am I here? Isn't that the age old question? Why are we here? And most people cannot answer that, number one, because they're trying to answer the third question without first having the relationship and then building on the relationship into some fellowship and communion. When you have the proper fellowship because of your relationship, relationship first, fellowship, then it opens up you to finding your purpose. And then the fourth thing they had was provision. Adam and Eve had everything they needed in the Garden of Eden. Everything they needed. They didn't want for anything. That's why, listen to this, listen to this, this is good. It's so what God gave me, I shared with you last week, and I'm sharing with, I'm trying to preach three, three messages in one. I do this often. So many of us are worried about the fourth thing, which is provision. Do I have everything I need? So that's why if I said, hey, what's the top things on your prayer list? It's, it's money, it's a new job, it's, it's a better this, a better that. It's things. And what did Jesus say? Put that up, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. What did he say? He said, seek ye first the what? The kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things. What I eat, what I wear, all the stuff that I need. He said, God will take care of you. Listen to me. This, if you don't listen to anything else, get this. Proper relationship. If you're saved, holler at me. 
All right. Uh, amen. That's good. All right. I want you to be saved. If you haven't been saved, you need to get saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you are saved, let me tell you something. God didn't save you just for you to sit here for the rest of your life on a church pew or a church bench and die and go to heaven one day. And your greatest claim to fame was I was a member of a church for 40 or 50 years. He made you to walk with him, to have purpose, and he was going to provide you with all the provision. He created you not just to life, but life more abundant. That's what Jesus said. So if you have the right relationship, let me tell you something. What you need to do is get through you a Bible. And I told you on Wednesday night, and I told you on Sunday morning, you need to get on your knees and you need to say, hey, God, I need to walk with you. And you said you would walk with me. You said if I draw close to you, you draw close to me. And God, I need you. I need you. I've never experienced to walk with you, Lord, but I want to. I'm going to start reading this book. And I've had people come to me and they say, Brandon, I read the Bible and I don't get anything out of it. I, I read it and I read chapter after chapter and I've done that for multiple days. Let me tell you something. Don't you give up. You get that book. You get on your knees and you open up that Bible and you say, God, you said you would walk with me. You said you would draw close to me if I draw close to you. And I need you, God, in my life. And I want to walk with you. You made me. I have the right relationship. And now I need fellowship and communion with you. God, I need you. Show yourself to me. And I promise you, if you get desperate and you pray that prayer, God will begin to reveal himself to you. The Bible says, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, I've got to have it. I'm hungry for it. I'm thirsty for it. These now I lay me down to sleep prayers aren't going to cut it. This getting an app on your phone that sends you a daily verse and you read that and call it your Bible reading because you read one verse. Ain't going to cut it. You got to get in that book and you got to spend time in that book. And you got to pray and you got to seek God's face. And you'll find your purpose, and God will provide everything you need. What I'm trying to get you to, listen to me, what I'm trying to get you to do is not live here first, looking for what God can give you, but start over there with what can you give God. The right relationship and fellowship and communion, that'll lead you to purpose, and then God's going to provide everything that you need. Did you know that Adam never said, you know what, I need a wife. He never said that. But he was created and he had the right relationship. And he started walking with God. And he had a purpose. And God looked down and says, hmm, it's not good that man be alone. I'm going to create somebody for him. And he created woman and gave her that great blessing to Adam that helped meet for him. God saw the need and gave it. Adam never prayed one time for that. He didn't even know he needed it. See, when you live in the right relationship and fellowship, God will provide things you don't even know you need. That's good. Somebody ought to say amen to that. All right, that's pretty good. Now I want to go on here into some new territory, the kingdom of God. And I want to show you some things that my voices are just about to give out. So I want you to listen to me. As I close this last half here, listen to me just for a few minutes. Here's what you have to understand. There's the kingdom of God. And this book right here, I guess this is how I should say it. This book right here is so unique because it is one big story about the kingdom of God. And on the flip side of the coin, there's the, another kingdom. The kingdom of darkness. There is, it's the age old cartoon. The angel on this shoulder saying, hey, do this. And the little pointy tail devil saying this way, right? Several years ago, an Indian evangelist said it this way. He said, on the inside of us is a white dog and a black dog. He said they're in a constant fight with each other. We have in our world today, and if you don't believe in evil and a kingdom of darkness, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how you can flip on your TV and see the, see the butchers called ISIS and say that there's not evil in this world. I don't know how you can say that there's not a kingdom of darkness. I don't see how you can see all the child trafficking and the human trafficking that goes on and say that there is not an influence on this world that is purely evil and demonic to its very core. 
And isn't that what Jesus said to us? He said, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against principalities and powers. You're wrestling against evil forces in high places. You are wrestling against the kingdom of darkness, trying, supposed to be, trying to establish the kingdom of God. This is what it all comes down to. The devil in the Garden of Eden, you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to mess things up for God. That's why he hates mankind. What is he still doing? He's still hating us. What's going to happen one day? He's going to get a big army and try to defeat God. And God's going to put him down. And he's going to put him in, 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 in the prison for a thousand years during the millennium. Why? Because it is a constant struggle between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God. You've got to understand that. To understand what I'm about to tell you. Everything, <clears throat> forgive my voice, everything in the Old Testament foreshadows and points to what would be fulfilled in the New Testament. Okay? So don't tell me the Old Testament's not important. It is, because it shows me what's going to come. That's why I told you there's hundreds of prophecies that tell me Jesus was going to come down to the where, when, and how he was going to be born. And if you study Daniel, even down to the year he, it was going to happen. The Old Testament prophesies Jesus. So watch what happens here. When I study the Old Testament. There is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what we call the Torah, the, the law of Moses. And then we find that when Moses was sent down to Egypt, it was because the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt, right? Egypt, if you study typology in the Bible, Egypt is, it represents the world. It represents sin. And Pharaoh represents Satan. That's what it does. So when God sent Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and they walked through the Red Sea, that is a picture of salvation, right? Okay, that is a picture of salvation. And then I always grew up, I grew up in a Baptist home. My dad's a Baptist preacher and I always heard songs about um, one day I'm going to cross over Jordan and I'm going to go into the promised land. And they sang songs about that like at a funeral. They'd say, hey, this person crossed over Jordan, went in the promised land. Okay, beautiful song, but I don't believe it's entirely scripturally accurate. Because crossing over the Jordan is not a picture of dying and going to heaven. Crossing over Jordan, it pictures when you come out of Egypt, you're saved. And once you're saved, you can either wander in the wilderness for 40 years and relearn the same lessons over and over. Or you can get to a point in your life where you enter into crossing the Jordan and entering into the kingdom of God and letting God fight your battles for you and win for you. And you can live the life that God has for you if you live in the promised land and not stay in the wilderness. That's what it pictures. Children of Israel, the whole Old Testament... They, they, get, they get saved. That's what leaving Egypt represents. And then they go into the wilderness. And what happens? So many of us, we die in the wilderness. We, we wander around and we're lost in the wilderness. We never get to a place of victory in our life. We never get to a place. We have the relationship, but we never get to a place of communion and fellowship. We never get to a place of finding our purpose. We never get to, to, to those next steps. And so we are always blocked out of the promised land. Now, now don't. Leave me here. I'm going somewhere. That being said, Israel headed to the promised land is like a Christian walking through the Christian life. And what I want you and me and our church to do is not stay in the wilderness, but cross over Jordan into the promised land. Cross over Jordan into that promised land and live a kingdom life where we have the right relationship where we have fellowship and communion, we find out our purpose, and we are provided all of the provision that we need. We're going to establish God's kingdom. Remember what Jesus said, thy kingdom come. What did, he said, I'm praying, God, that your kingdom would come down to where I'm at. Now, I want to show you some things here. I'm going to show you two last verses here, and I'm going to teach you a little bit about Joshua. Joshua, the Bible says, in chapter number 5, Verse number 13, I want to show you something. Now, now picture this. Joshua is leading one million to two million people now. Moses led them out of Egypt. That was a picture of their salvation, right? Now Joshua has taken over. The Bible says, Moses, my servant, is dead. 
and Joshua, the son of Nun, takes over. Now I want you to understand something. All the people that left Egypt 20 years old and older died in the wilderness. They never saw the promised land because they would not believe and have the faith. They, they forced God to teach them the same lessons. They complained against God. They lived their life like we live our Christian life sometimes. We were back and forth hot and cold with God. Sometimes we're on fire for God and then we're like, why does God do this? Why does God do that? I lost my job. God hates me. And they were back and forth. And they would do that. They would go through their life. They'd be on the mountaintop one day. And then the next day they'd be like, I'm hungry. Where's God? He didn't feed me today. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. They would complain. Man, I wish I had died in Egypt as a slave rather than come out here and die in the wilderness. They would say things like that. And God said, if you're going to live there, you're never going to get to where I want you to get. And so they died in the wilderness. So Joshua takes command of about one to two million Jews to lead them into the promised land across the Jordan River. And guess what? The first place that they're going to come to is Jericho. And Jericho, archaeologists tell us, was a hugely fortified city. In fact, the next battle that they had was a little town called Ai. If I'd been planning out the strategy... And not God, I'd been like, hey, let's start with AI, let's get our feet wet, right? Taking this land, and let's not start with the big, the big enchilada, right? That's Jericho, man. I mean, look at those walls. Look at everything that they've got. Now, here's what you don't understand. They are going back, the children of Israel, into the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is where Abraham was before they went to Egypt, right? Right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in the land of Canaan. His people went down to Egypt. Joseph was down there. They were in the world for about 400 years, and God came and let them out. But when they get back, they find that the land of Canaan, where God wants them to be, is filled with a bunch of people who hate God and ain't going to give the land back to them. The enemies of God's people had moved in, right? The enemies of God's people had moved into the very land that they were supposed to possess. And now they've got to go into the land and they've got to fight their way in. They've got to fight their way in and lay claim to what God had given them. What is that? That is a picture of your life and my life. Let me tell you something. If you want to live a kingdom life and you, want, you have the proper relationship, you're saved. If you want to get over here and you want to start living a kingdom life, let me tell you something. You're going to have to fight for it. Because there's a kingdom of darkness pushing back against you and fighting you tooth and nail every step of the way. Don't you feel like that sometimes? Man, I want to do good. Man, I want to please God with my life. I want to stop doing this. I want to start doing this. And you feel like every time you say, hey, I'm going to do this, it's like something slaps you back down and puts you back in your place. And you get up again and you try it again and you get knocked down again. Why? Because something is fighting against you. It's called the kingdom of darkness. Why? Because the kingdom of darkness hates the kingdom of God and doesn't want you to live there. And all the devil's seed had moved into the land. And I don't have time to take and develop that. But all the enemies of God had moved into the land and taken what rightfully belonged to the Israelites. And they had to fight their way in. And Joshua has just become the brand new leader. And <laughs> Moses had led him for 40 years. And he didn't have to fight the battle. But here's Joshua. And God says, hey, get him up across Jordan. We're going to take the land. And here's Joshua, this young leader and I believe that he was a little bit overwhelmed because the Bible says the night before the battle of Jericho he's out there pacing on the road now watch this and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho now watch this he, he's out here by Jericho walking around by himself looking at the city because tomorrow he's supposed to take this place he's supposed to take it for God I'm supposed to take Jericho and it's not supposed to be the kingdom of the enemy anymore. It's supposed to be the kingdom of God. And I'm a little, I'm stressing over it, he said. I'm fretting over it. And he's out there walking, probably praying, saying, God, help me. He's scared. He's nervous. Here's Joshua. In one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible, the Bible says this. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho... That he lifted up his eyes and looked. 
And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. So Joshua, he's walking along Jericho, and he comes across this man who has a drawn sword, and he's walking by, and here's what Joshua said. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Joshua said, Whoa! He kind of stumbled on him. He said, Hey, are you with our enemies? Or are you on the side of Israel? Are you on my side? Or are you on their side? Watch what happens. He, he answers him with one word. Next verse, he says this. And he said, nay. No. I'm not on your side and I'm not on their side. No. I'm not. Are you for us? Or are you with the people of Jericho? Are you for us or for our enemies? No. I'm not. Watch what he says. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Joshua stumbled on, and if you'll study this out, you will find that this is what theologians call a Christophany. This is Christ in the Old Testament. Because the captain of the armies of the host of the Lord, the captain of the angel armies, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. He will lead them to put down the devil in the book of Revelation. This is Jesus Christ. And by the way, Joshua knelt down and worshipped him, the Bible says in the next verse, and no angel. Every time God sent an angel to give a message to somebody, a lot of times they would try to bow down and worship them. And the angel would always say, no, 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 get up off your feet. I ain't God. You don't worship me. But here, that does not happen because this is no angel. This is Jesus Christ himself. But I want you to notice what he says here. He says, are you for us or for our enemies? And he says, no. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? Now, listen to this. Jesus here did not say, I'm on your side. He did not say, I'm on the side of Jericho. You know what Jesus was there for? To find out if Joshua was on his side. See, because you and I, we often think there's three sides. Listen to me, guys, and don't miss this point. Every teenager, listen to me, because how you live your life today and tomorrow at school, it matters. Listen to me. We often think, am I going to follow God? Am I going to follow the devil? Or I'm just, am I just going to do what I want to do? Are you for us or for them? Are you on my side or their side, God? See, there's not three sides, though. There's just two. You're either on their side or you're on his side. There's not three sides. You don't get a side. Now, let me sum up what I'm saying here in a simple statement. Listen to me. Everybody look at me. I'm almost done. Hang with me. Everywhere you walk in your life, you are claiming ground for a kingdom. And there's only two kingdoms. You're claiming ground for the kingdom of darkness or you're claiming ground for the kingdom of God. What does kingdom mean? It means the realm in which that king rules. So when you walk through your life, there is no your side and their side and God's side. It's just God's side and darkness's side. You understand what I'm saying? There's, there's just two. There's just two. And you are either claiming ground for the kingdom of darkness or you're claiming ground for the kingdom of God. That's it. When I go through my life, when I sin, when I do it willfully and, and, and just, just, just throw caution to the wind, I am claiming ground for the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of God. You teenagers, when you go through life and, and you live your life in certain ways, let me tell you something. You are living every day, every time you put your foot in front of the other, you are claiming ground for a kingdom. Which kingdom is it? 
That's what we're doing in life. And Jesus said, I pray, if you want to know how to pray, you invite the kingdom of God to rule where you're walking today, where you're talking today, what you're thinking today. You invite God to be right there, and you stake out that ground for Him. He said it to Joshua this way in a previous verse, and this is the last verse I'll show you, and I'll show you, and I'm going to button this all up and put a bow on it. Joshua chapter number 1, verse number 3 says this. And the uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verse three, God told the children of Israel, watch this, it, when they went into the land, watch this, he told them, he said, I want you to go into the land and I want you to take the land and I want you to kick out the devil's seed. I want you to kick out everybody that's got your land and I want you to claim it for the kingdom of God. And he says this, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses he said listen to me Joshua he said when you go into that land I want you to know something you are here to claim the promised land the land that flows with milk and honey you are here to claim it for God because it was my land and I gave it to Abraham and his descendants and it is rightfully yours and every place that the soul of your foot goes you claim that ground for the kingdom of God that's what he's saying you claim it right here you claim it right here now go back to Joshua Chapter 5, Paul. Joshua chapter 5, verse number, go down to verse number uh, 14, or uh, 15, I'm sorry. After he talked to Jesus and he said, Who's, whose side are you on? Jesus says this to him, loose thy shoe from off, thou, off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. He said, listen to me, son. You're going to claim some ground for the kingdom of God. And let's start right here. Take off your shoes. And this area right here where you met with me is the first area you're going to claim for the kingdom of God. And tomorrow you follow my instructions to the T. And you're going to bring down the walls of Jericho. And we're going to start with the biggest, baddest prize there is in all the promised land. We're going to start with it. And you're going to bring it down and destroy it. Because this land belongs to you. And you're not going to let the kingdom of darkness keep it. Take off your shoes, son. You're on holy ground. Simple question. Last Sunday morning, I began unpacking this kingdom of heaven teaching to you. And I said, hey, what kind of year do you want to have in 2018? What kingdom do you want to be serving in 2018? Do you, want, do you have the right relationship? Do you have the right fellowship? Do you have the right communion? Do you have the right purpose? Do you know your purpose in life? And if you don't know it, you better, you better go before God and you better fall on your knees and say, God, I need purpose in my life. I need to know what I'm here for. And I don't have the right relationship and fellowship. If I, if I don't have the right relationship, I'm going to get saved. If I haven't been walking with you, I'm going to start walking with you because I got to know my purpose. I got to know why I'm here. I want the kingdom of God to be in my life today. Today I ask you another question, because this is a getting right time for our church and for me and for you. You got to realize you're in a struggle today. You got to realize, like Paul said, every day when you wake up, your biggest enemy is you and you got to decide who you're going to live for today. Are you going to live for the kingdom of God? Or are you going to live for the kingdom of darkness? Are you going to walk and take territory for the kingdom of darkness? Or are you going to walk and take territory and lay claim to your life, to your uh, everything in your life for the kingdom of God? So I ask you that. I ask you that today. Who are you taking ground for today? And don't tell me, oh, I don't buy into all that. I ain't taking ground for nobody. Yes, you are, because there's two kingdoms and you're advancing one or the other. Don't give me that. If you're not for us, Jesus said, he that is not for us is against us. Let me ask you this. Are you taking ground for God's kingdom in your life today? Am I? Are you scared to pray the prayer, God? I want your kingdom to come into my life. Are you scared to pray that prayer? Because you know that there's things in your life that are not of the kingdom of God, but of the kingdom of darkness. God, God, I want you to come into my mind today and the thoughts that I think, the things that I see, the hands 
what I touch and where I go. I want your kingdom to rule there. You teenagers, are you scared to pray that prayer? God, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to school. I'm going to go back to school for some of you. God, I want to live in your kingdom. I want to walk in your kingdom. I want the steps that I take down that hallway at school. I don't want it to be filled with the wrong kind of talk and the wrong kind of text and the wrong kind of Snapchats and the wrong kind of pictures. I want it to be claimed for you. And I give my life, my steps tomorrow at school to you for the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Do we have any teenagers who are bold enough to pray that prayer? Do we have any husbands and wives bold enough to pray it? See, so often we get little issues between us and we think that we're, we got little issues between us. But what we're actually fighting is something more powerful and it's the kingdom of darkness trying to mess you up from living in the kingdom of God. But when you invite the kingdom of God in and you surrender to God's will and you do what He says... You are inviting the kingdom of God into your marriage, into your home, into the raising of your kids, into how you live your life, into how you conduct business, into the kind of person you are, into the kind of work ethic that you have. I want the kingdom of God to rule in my life. This country is dying and wanting somebody, church people, born again Christians, to realize there's more to the kingdom of God than just having the right relationship. Yes, I'm saved, but I am to move on and establish and take ground for the kingdom of God. Are you going to do that? You've got to make a choice. I've got to make a choice. There is no, well, maybe, there is no your side. It's either their side or his side. It's either the captain of the army or the host of the Lord or it's Jericho's side. You don't have a side, Joshua. I'm not on your side. Are you on mine is what Jesus said to him. Let me ask you something. Are you on God's side? Am I on God's side? Man, does God rule in my life? Does the kingdom of God rule in my life? Does he rule in your life? Husband, wife, does he rule in your marriage? Teenager, does he rule in your life or are you just filled with rebellion and the wrong kind of attitude? And you, got, you, you know you're not right. You, you've been taking ground, but you've been taking it for the wrong kingdom. You've been fighting mom and dad and they're trying to do good things for you, but you've been, you've been rebellious against them. And let me tell you something, you've been rebelling against them, but not only them, against God. And you know what you need to do? You need... To get things ironed out between you and God and reestablish that fellowship because you've messed it up. You know what the hope of this country is? It's you young folks sitting here saying, you know what, I'm going to live my life for the kingdom of God, not for the kingdom of darkness. <coughs> this is a timely message for our church. A timely series. Because what kind of church are we going to be this year? I want to be a church that's taking ground away from the enemy and establishing more territory for the kingdom of God. But it's going to be a fight. And you know what all of us have to do? All of us have to be inviting the kingdom into our lives, into our church. We sang about it just a second ago, and it has the same message. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fill our hearts and fill this atmosphere. Will you invite God into the nitty-gritty of your life today? You couples that are dating or engaged, will you invite God into that relationship? You couples that are struggling, you're struggling. Well, tell me you tried everything when you haven't asked God to come in and establish his kingdom. In your marriage. Are you struggling. With sin. You keep getting beat down. It's like Paul said. I so identify with Paul. The good that I would. I do not. But the evil which I would not. I do.
I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to ask that you not get up right now and not move around too much. I want to kind of put the cherry on top of this message. Last Sunday morning, this altar was filled with people who said, I want my 2018 to be filled with fellowship and communion with God, with finding my purpose and trusting God for my provision. All based on the fact that I have the right relationship. My question for you is this. Number one, are you here this morning and you say, Brandon, I, I know that I have the right relationship with God. I've been born again. I remember the place. I remember God saved me. I have no doubt about it. I know I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Would you just slip up your hand? Brandon, I know I'm saved. Nobody looking around, just me, please. You can put your hands down. Is there anybody here and you say, Brandon, I don't know. If I died today, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I'm born again. I don't know that Jesus has taken all my sins away, but I sure would love to know about that. It's not hard. I wouldn't embarrass you, but would you be bold enough to raise your hand right now and say, Brandon, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not 100% sure. I always thought maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but I'm like 70% sure, 80%, 50%. I'm not sure though. Anybody here like that? Just slip up your hand and say, Brandon, pray for me. I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Anybody like that? Anybody like that? By testimony, I don't see any hands. So by testimony, you're born again here this morning. Let me ask you this, Christian. Do you just have the right relationship and that's it? And your fellowship's not where it ought to be? And you're lacking purpose in your life because you haven't invited the kingdom into your, into your life. You're more worried about provision instead of, let, instead of letting God worry about the provision and you worry about the kingdom. Does that describe you? Because can I be honest with you? Man, that so often describes me. Are you struggling in your life to defeat sin? To defeat Whatever the devil's throwing at you, that kingdom of darkness, you're struggling with some things in your life and you need to invite the kingdom of God in and lay claim to that area of your life for God. And you need help to do that. You need prayer because it ain't going to be easy. It's going to be a fight every day. But is that where you're at this morning? In a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. And once again this morning, I'm going to open this altar. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be here because this business of the kingdom, I'm beginning to understand it, but I'm not there yet. And I need the kingdom of God to invade my life. And I need to be open to inviting the kingdom in. And I need it in areas of my life. I want my life and my, my God to rule and reign in those areas of my life. Maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, hey, you know what, Brandon? Seven or eight. Of the areas in my life, God's ruling, but there's that one area that he's not. I'm not letting him in that area. That's not his territory. He's not king of that. I'm king of that. When you say you're king of that, what you're saying is, darkness is the king of that. And I want you to realize that there's just two teams. There's not three teams on the football field, just two. Which one are you on? I want you to do business with God as he moves in you. I want you, if nothing else, if things are good in your life spiritually and relationally, I would love for you to spend some time this morning praying for our church that the kingdom of God would broaden the kingdom of God's territory in our area and reach more people and lead more people into the kingdom of God. I'm going to ask you, if you will, keep your heads bowed, eyes closed, but stand to your feet right where you're at. I'm going to open this altar up right now and I'm going to be the first one in it because I need the kingdom of God to rule in my life. If you're the same way, I'm going to ask you, don't be shy. Come down here and do business with God today as he moves in your heart right now.